Well, good evening and welcome everyone to another webinar here on the Societies of Photographers page. We're also joined with Wilkinson's Cameras. So welcome to everyone who's tuning in from their page. We've got a fantastic webinar lined up for you tonight with uh, Terry Donnelly, who's one of our judges. He's a fellow member with us and he's going to be talking about the wheelchair air ambulance project he did with them and about all the pictures and the background of the pictures and also the gear he used. We've also got Mark Baby here joining us from uh, Sony. It's fantastic to have you both back with us. How are we doing, guys? You okay? Yeah, good. Thank you, Colin. How are you? Really good, really good. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's, uh, I, you know, we, we've been through the presentation this before, but you also displayed the, the project at the convention we had in January. Yeah, we did. And, and thank you again for that, Colin. It was very good of yourself and the societies to allow us to do that. Um, I think we displayed about 25 images in print. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But it was, it was great to see the actual project lined up. And, uh, you know, uh, we saw the pictures and all the kind of like the, the background to them. But we're, you're going to tell us a little bit about the background of some of the people that uh, you photographed and uh, about the uh, the wheelchair air ambulance themselves, uh, which is going to be a really interesting part of the webinar tonight. Yeah, indeed, Colin. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to give you an introduction about the, the project itself, uh, how Sony became involved in the project. And also, I want to speak about about how the, the Sony Alpha system has really changed the way I, um, I, I shoot my photography now and speak about five innovations which I wouldn't be without in, the, in my daily work anymore. Fantastic. And uh, thanks again, Mark, uh, for joining us uh, and for helping us organise all these webinars. We really appreciate all the effort uh, that you're, you're helping us to, to bring all this fantastic content to our members. Uh, and I know you said uh, when we're putting these together, it'd be fantastic to get Terry on to, to do one of these one of these talks. Um, but obviously, this is the kind of thing that would be normally done on the road shows uh, with you, isn't it? So you, you'd be doing the masterclasses with us as well as, well as uh, showing all the members our, uh, your, your fantastic range of cameras and lenses. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Great to be here. Thank you for Terry to um, showing uh, his project and all all the work that he does, uh, and sharing how how he's obviously achieved that. Um, and yeah, great. I mean, it, it, it we're doing this now. It seems to be the future of what we're doing. So, and uh, we seem to be gaining quite a wide audience doing it as well. So, thank you for the opportunity. And um, yeah, looking forward to what Terry's going to go through. Yeah, amazing. And uh, again, just a massive thank you for, to. Wilkinson cameras for uh, helping us with tonight and um, being there. I think they're in the comments. So if you do have any questions uh, for, for any of the four of us, so that's either uh, Terry, if you've got any questions going along for Terry, or you've got any technical questions on the Sony uh, kit, then please put them in the comments. And I'm sure uh, either myself or Wilkinson uh, cameras will be in there to, to answer any questions. And obviously we can, can pitch them to Terry and Mark throughout the webinar as well. So we're really looking forward to it. So uh, I think, are you happy that we, we we start the presentation now and we'll we'll grab that up on your computer, Terry? Yeah, absolutely, Colin, but you may need to just um, just guide me. Um, That's okay. So it's just the, the, the share screen at the bottom. And I think we did entire screen, didn't we? Yeah. So uh, also to anyone watching, just while we're just getting this set up, if you let us know where you're watching from, because it's fantastic to see where people are tuning in from. Uh, from all over the UK and, and from further afield around the globe, we've got people tuning in, which is fantastic to see. Um, so, yeah, your computer shared now. So if you bring up the presentation, we should be good to go. So we've got Cl Clive Greenland on, who's actually oh. from Wiltshire. So there you go. Yeah. Brilliant. I will pull that up. Oh, another Wiltshire. <laughs> They're all giving it now. So let's add that to the stream. Boom. And you are good to go. You've just got a uh, StreamYard is sharing your screen. Can you see that, Terry? Um, We've got it just on, just underneath the H of the heli helipad. Right. What am I doing wrong here? Just, just pull it. If you just pull that down to the bottom of your screen. This one? Yeah. Yeah, and, and then bring it up again. It should, should, just so it's disappeared a bit. Ah, okay. Let's have a look at that. Perfect. That'll do us. Great. Awesome. So, I think what we'll do for now is we, me and Mark, uh, will bow out the presentation uh, while you while you start. I will pop in with any questions, and again, if anyone's got any questions uh, on the kit and stuff, I can pull Mark back in as well. But for now, we'll hand over to you. The reins over to you, Terry. So thank you very much for that to, uh, tonight, Terry. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Colin. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and lead you through this. I'll, I'll give you a good background about um, the whole project, uh, as mentioned, but also steer you through um, some of the pictures, some of the behind the scenes, and just really try and share and show you how these cameras uh, make it possible for me to do what I do. Um, first of all, though, I, I must thank Mark for inviting me on. Um, yourself, Colin, and the societies for hosting it, and for Wilkinson's for supporting the, the webinar tonight. So I'm going to speak about the time I spent with the Wiltshire Air Ambulance, the Helms, Helms crew, um, and that was in 2019. I spent three full days with them. Um, There's five innovations in these cameras, which I use on a daily basis, and some of them might seem a little bit obvious, but they make a big difference to when you're actually using the cameras live and using them every single day and, you know, um, for many, many hours. So this year, the Wiltshire Air Ambulance celebrated 30 years of operation. Um, and the three days I spent with them, I wanted to get a unique insight into what they do, um, the, the Hems crew. And just generally, the things what you'd never, ever see. I didn't want to get the, you know, the glossy pictures of people standing perhaps with, um, you know, a donation that's being raised or standing by the helicopter or spouse. I just wanted to see a little bit more the way the charity operated. And the aim was simple. Through photography, I wanted to highlight the charity's self-funding financial requirements um, to keep the aircraft flying, keep the medical service uh, running, <clears throat> and also to keep the RRV vehicles, which are the ground-based vehicles, in operation. Now, that actually stands at £3.75 million pounds a year, which they have to raise just to keep the service operational. And that works out at a measly £10,000 a day. Now, it's an awful lot of money to raise, but £10,000, and, you know, it, it, they could be out doing three life-saving missions per day. Uh, I think that's the average what they run at. You know, it's £3,000 to save a person's life. It's... When you look at it that way, it's not a lot of money. But from the other side, the fundraising aspect of it, it's a huge amount of money to raise. So when I look back at how I was going to do this, I need I need the support. And this, this is taken from Sony's uh, website. Um, I'm very, very proud to be a Sony Europe Imaging Ambassador. Um, and this statement from the Sony Europe website, it says that um, the Imaging Ambassador European programme is about storytelling. And through the Imaging Ambassadors programme, we at Sony make it our priority to support great storytellers and provide them with infinite ways to create beautiful imagery. And they do that a number of ways. So I approached Sony and I said, look, this is a project I'm going to do. I'd love to have your support with it. Um, I explained to them what it was I wanted to do, how I could do it, and what the end result we, we were looking to achieve, which would be to raise the profile of the air ambulance service and also to generate people who may be interested then to go on and do fundraising for them. <coughs> Excuse me. So Sony agreed to help with the project in different ways, and we managed to complete the work and number, put a number of print exhibitions together. Um, and the one what you mentioned, Colin, obviously, was... Um, at the societies in January of this year. So we had great support as well besides Sony. We had the uh, photo speed came on board and helped us with print. And they did all the print for the exhibitions, um, including all the mounting on the boards. Um, so we, they came together really, the photographic industry. They really pulled together and uh, made a difference, which is the great thing about our industry really. So when we look back um, into Wiltshire Air Ambulance, it's quite a distance from me as I live in the northwest of England. But my background and my history with the, the emergency services, and in particular with the Air Ambulance, the, the Northwest Air Ambulance, stretches back to 2004. And I used to do a lot of work. I used to do a lot of um, photography, which would be used like in this instance in, in the Skylines magazine. We do some event photography. And I worked on several projects with uh, the CEO at the time, Linda Brislin, who's uh, still a good friend of mine. So I've always had that history. Now, why I chose Wiltshire Air Ambulance, even though it was quite a bit of a distance and the logistics were more awkward, 
In fact, they're actually based in their own air base. They've got a purpose-built air base where everybody is, is there, all the medical staff, um, the helicopter station there, uh, the management team are all there, um, the charity fundraising section is all there. So it made good sense to be based in that one place. So just to give you a little bit of a, a background about the air ambulance service and what it does, I've mentioned the 3.75 million uh, funding they require, uh, 10,000 pound a day. They attended last year uh, 1,233 incidents in 2019. And they can reach anywhere in wheelchair within 11 minutes. And that's quite some task really when you realize how, how vast wheelchair is. And three small words from the website of Wheelchair Air Ambulance, we save lives. And, you know, that's an incredible statement. That, um, and, and that's the reality of what they do. You know, if, you, if, you, if somebody gets a, you know, um, a sprained ankle or, you know, they suffer a small cough that might require a few stitches, you're unlikely to see the Wheelchair Air Ambulance crew. But if you've got somebody who needs critical care because they're in a situation where, you know, um, they could possibly die or they've got life-threatening injuries, then the air ambulance will be called into action. And um, that's a big statement. We save lives. It's exactly what they do. So if we just break down that 11 minutes uh, of the way they operate. They allocate one minute to taking a call, um, one minute to prepare the, the helicopter for takeoff, one minute to actually lift off, um, seven minutes flight time they can reach anywhere in wheelchair so Bath is five minutes um, Salisbury seven minutes and it, they'll circle on land within one minute so that's a total of 11 minutes that's the max uh, the call sign for the helicopter is Helimed 22 and it's a, they fly a Bell 429 helicopter which is a general purpose helicopter it's used worldwide in, uh, in uh, emergency service operations <clears throat> And that has a top flight speed of 178 miles per hour. So straight line at 178 miles an hour, it can reach, you know, um, a lot of places really, really quick. It's operational up to 19 hours a day. And it's one of the few emergency service helicopters in the UK, which is uh, night flight capable. They have full uh, night vision uh, operation. And if you want to support them in any way, wheelchairambulance.co.uk is their website. Please go and check them out, they run their own lottery, they do social events. There's lots and lots of things you can be involved in to help them. Um, and what, one of the aims I wanted was, I mean, we get used now to air traffic and how many times might you see an air ambulance flying overhead? But what you may not realise is that it's self-funded. They don't get any money from the government. To keep that operation in service, they have to raise the funds. So whatever small amount you can give or or help them with it, it makes a difference it can literally save somebody's life so that that's wheelchair air ambulance and that was the aims about what what we were doing and why we wanted to do it and um, just returning to me for people that don't know um, i work in portraiture sports editorial pr and promotions i also carry um, a full uk press card uh, authority uh, card so I have a mix of photography things, what I do. Um, a lot of what I do, particularly in sport, goes out into the national press and international press, and that gets seen by a lot of people. I also have private clients who perhaps you, you may not see as much work of. Um, but I do a, a, quite a wide range of photographic work. Terry, just before you move on, I've got a couple of questions, if that's okay. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, Kirsty's saying, uh, or asking, how many years have you been in photography and who inspired you to start photography? Uh, well, do you know what? I've always been into photography since I was a child. And my uncle used to work in the housing department and Liverpool City Council and he used to give me old cameras. He, he was always finding them. They were getting thrown away or, or you know, uh, dumped in the city. And uh, he'd always bring them to me and I was always fascinated with them the way they worked. So... I used to spend a lot of time when I was a child with photography, with film. Um, when I left school, I sort of went more into video work. And then 
I came away from it a little bit, and then I came back about 2000 and two, 2001, 2002. I started getting more involved in photography again. And then since then, it's, it's pretty much been um, foot of the floorboards, really. Um, Inspirational-wise, it, it's probably somebody a, a lot of people would have heard of, um, but, but Joe McNally has always been a, a huge uh, favourite as a photographer for me. Um, his style of imagery, the way he achieves it, um, he's, he's a massive favourite. But there's, there's, there's lots and lots and lots of photographers I admire, but uh, Joe is certainly one which, which would stand out. Brilliant, perfect. I'll, I'll leave you on. It's just that that fitted in perfectly to uh, to what you're talking about. Awesome, thanks, Carl. Yeah, so um, I tell you what, I, sh I should really mention this. Really, um, my little roots of being involved with the Sony cameras. It was actually a convention in 2017. I had a conversation with somebody. I think his name was Mark. Might have been Baber at the time. Yeah, it was. It was Mark Baber. Um, and following on from that conversation, I was asked to try out a Sony full-frame alpha camera. Now, Mark knew I had a history of um, using mirrorless cameras, but I used them alongside the SLR cameras. So Mark said to me, I want you to try one of these cameras. I've, you know, I'm working with Sony now, and I think you'd love it. I'd like your opinion. So... Uh, he kindly loaned to me an A7R Mark II and the 16 to 35 Zeiss F4 lens. So I brought it back with me. I had it for about a month, I think. And I tried the camera out um, and I enjoyed using it. I put the pictures onto the computer and the actual quality in the files really, really stood out. Um, Different scenarios, I, I tried the camera in different ways and low light um, in, in poor light, but everything I threw at the camera, it, it was still giving me a quality uh, image. And that image, uh, the file, I could push and pull it, I could do anything with it, and it's still, the integrity was still in the, in the image. So from that point on, I was really hooked on the Sony system. Now, when um, Mark actually took that camera back, um, I'd made my mind up then I was going to get into the Sony. But it was always going to run alongside the DSLR, which had happened previously because DSLRs were king of, um, you know, uh, the autofocus system. Uh, I, I was used to shooting with top-end DSLR cameras and that focus system, what those cameras are capable of, that's what I needed in the work, in particular for sport. And at that time, it wasn't in mirrorless cameras. So moving on, um, I think it was around April time, and Mark might be able to remember this more than I, um, but we were in Hungerford, I believe, and Mark had one of the first Sony A9 camera bodies in the country. So we said, would you like to try it? And obviously um, I said, yeah. And um, I, I, I was just amazed with it. The, the, the focusing system was so fast, so accurate, uh, and I think I stood on the road for probably an hour or so, just trying it on cars, moving up and down and from that moment on i knew i was going to end up coming completely away from the dslr um and, and jumped into the sony system and i have done uh, ever since it's um that was a massive massive turning point for me uh, with the camera system i always enjoyed the feature sets of the middleless cameras but now i had it with the full quality with the, the file quality with the uh, ability with the um, super fast focus and ability of the a9 uh, 20 frames per second um it was it just made no sense for me to stay with the slr so then at that point i jumped straight in to the sony system but i want to go through and show you a few more things um and, and just talk about the system itself more as well when i did the air ambulance project these were the two cameras and the seven lenses are used normally if i'm going out to do any sort of job I'll only take out what I need. If I'm going out to do a press job, I'll take two bodies and two lenses because I want to move fast. Um, I don't want to be carrying too much stuff. I'm, I'll often be in a crowd, so I'll always take out what I want. Um, if I'm doing work in a sporting event on the pitch side, then obviously I'll take the 400mm 2.8, 70 to 200, maybe a wide body. 
of them putting the remote camera behind the, the goal nets. It'll take a fourth body. So I'll always just pick and choose and take out what I need from the kit. But in this instance, I took everything with me basically because um, I didn't know what I was going into, what each scenario would be, whether it be um, flying in the helicopter, whether it be in a ground vehicle, whether it be at the, the air base. I just didn't know where I was going or what I'd be doing. So I took a lot more kit. So this this was it. And there's a lot of lenses there, there's seven, but with this setup, I, I can actually take care of any job which is uh, thrown at me. And if I just mentioned this for you as well, anyone who's, who's looking and they're a bit confused with the, the Sony Alpha cameras, there's actually four cameras in the range. These are full fame cameras. And each one is slightly different. It's slightly weighted um, to a different scenario or a different type of photographer for what they may be looking the camera to do. So the A7 III is the great all-round camera. It's, it's really, really good at anything you need it to do. Um, it's 10 frames a second, 15 stops dynamic range, back illuminated sensor, and that's 24 megapixel. Sony A7S III, which is just launched today. Mark has done an amazing video with this. If you want to check it out or ask Mark any questions about it later, but this is just going to blow the industry um, wide open in terms of video and low-life photography. The S in the A7S uh, stands for sensitivity. The A7R4 and the R stands for resolution. This one is 61 megapixel. So perhaps if you're a studio photographer or landscape photographer and you want to generate the really big file sizes, this is the camera for you. The Sony A9 is all about speed. It's for pro sport photographers, nature photographers, Anybody who needs um, 20 frames a second uh, can fire 241 raw shots without hitting the buffer. It's got zero blackout in the EVF. So that flick when you're taking your pictures, um, that doesn't happen with this camera. You get a constant feed coming through the EVF or to the rear screen, and it's 24 megapixel, 693 autofocus points. Now, the five innovations which I really couldn't be without, um, I'll... I'll quickly go through these and then i'm going to show you photographs and refer you back to these five innovations so the first one is i auto focus and the system what sony have developed is that the camera will recognize a human iris and it'll lock focus on and it'll lock on and it'll track and it'll trace even on the a9 firing at 20 frames a second it will still track the eye on every single frame. It's an incredible system. So if you if you want to shoot a f1.4 with a really wide aperture, you can have confidence that the photo focus system will be squarely caught on the eye and your pictures on the eye will be razor, razor sharp. It's an amazing system. I use the eye auto focus all the time. It's, it's really is outstanding. And the second one is um, in-body image stabilization ibis and it's five way on the sony so you've got a uh, pitch your and roll and also you've got lateral and their uh, vertical movement and what that does is everybody has a tremor in the hands it's just natural that we do um it may not be perceivable but it's there and basically what happens is the sensor is um is resting on magnets so as your hand movement runs in one direction, the sensor will move in the opposite direction. So the net effect is that that sensor stays in the same place. So what that means is you can shoot at really slow shutter speeds and still obtain sharp images. And I'm going to show you lots of examples of that as we go through. The next one is silent shutter. You can shoot these cameras totally silent without making any noise at all. So if you're a wedding photographer and you're in a church, you don't want to disturb any of the service, you can be taking pictures and not making a single sound. Nature photographers, if you go to a hive and you know, you're worried about um, scaring away whatever it is you're photographing outside, it won't happen with these cameras. They're totally silent. Um, sports photographers, a lot of sports, you can't make any noise before a certain point. Um, a golfer on a downswing, um, you can't, you know, you can't be clattering away with a DSLR. With these cameras, you can be firing very, very early on and not making a noise at all. I 
And a wazzy wig, uh, what you see is what you get. One of the big things with shooting with um, mirrorless cameras is that you can see um, in the EVF, which is the little TV screen and the eyepiece, as opposed to being optical or on the rear screen. If you think about your DSLR, you see through the lens. With a mirrorless camera, you see what the sensor sees. And that's a big difference because you're seeing the color temperature, you're seeing the exact focus, and you're seeing depth of field, um, exactly what you're going to capture on the sensor is what you see before you commit and press the shutter. And for me, it's, it's that's made a huge difference because when I used to shoot the SLR, I'd take a picture, and the first thing I'd do is nose the camera down, press play, and zoom in to see if I've got a sharp image where it needs to be sharp. I don't do that with these cameras now. I keep shooting. I see the picture as it comes in. I'm seeing it live as I'm committing to press the shutter. So it makes the work um, a lot quicker. It means I can get more done. And it takes me away from worrying about whether the camera's done its job properly. I know it has. So it's a huge difference. It's, 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 it's a game changer. I hate that saying, but it is it really is a game changer. And this one, which is a, a little bit more obvious, um, but the articulating rear screen, you know, it's when we take a picture from normal eye highs, it's it's quite a normal view what people are used to seeing. Um, so being able to shoot from high up or low down is a big thing for me. It's something that I always do. And having that articulating screen allows me to do it. Um, when I think back to what I used to do with the SLR, I'd be lying on, on my stomach face down trying to get a really low shot and you'd be getting, you know, your clothes would be getting um, full of mud or whatever you're lying on. It, it's a simple thing. And, you know, you might say, well, lots of cameras have got them, and they have. But the top-end cameras, um, it's certainly in DSLRs. I mean, I, I shot Nikon for a long time. Every single one of them, D5, D4S, D4, D3, it was a thick screen. So when I wanted to get an angle, it, it was a lot more difficult. But this is, you know, it, it's something I use all the time. And, again, I'll show you an example to that as we step through the images. <clears throat> If you want to take that, what you see is what you get to a, an, an extra level. Um, again, I, I, I shoot with Rotolite and I shoot with these on continuous light mode. And you'll see examples of this as we step through. Um, so as well as seeing your exposure value, what you set in camera, you can actually see uh, the light and patterns, um, color temperature and everything else from the lights. So this is um, frame one and it's, it's a general view. So this is quite a good one to show you to start off with. So this is the airbase in, um, in, in Melksham, and it's purpose-built. I think it's about 12 months old, and you can see we've got the hangar for the aircraft. We've got all the officers there, um, all the support buildings, the ancillaries, everything what that aircraft needs to keep flying it is here at this base. And that's one of the main reasons why um, I chose to offer the project to this particular region. So one of the things we wanted to do was get a picture from a chase helicopter, which, I, which I'm in, um, looking back at the, the air base with a Helimed 2-2 coming into land. Now, a couple of considerations with this is that whenever you're shooting an aircraft, whether it's got um, rotors as a helicopter or propellers on, on, a, on a plane, you want to see movement in the rotors. There's nothing worse than seeing a frozen set of rotors or propellers with, with a, the aircraft in the air. Uh, it just doesn't look natural. So we need the slow shutter speed to get that rotor spin, to get the movement in the rotors. The problem I had with this one is that the aircraft I was in, it was quite windy, and I, we were getting buffered to the bow quite a bit. And if you can imagine being on a boat and it's you know it's quite choppy, the water, and you're to and fro, and it, it's, it's that type of environment we were in. Um, so it was a case, really, of finding a shutter speed which was quick enough to help with the movement of the aircraft I was in, but slow enough to make them rotors blare. And photograph um, photography is always a compromise, whatever we do. We never seem to have enough of everything what we need. We're always looking to chop and change or sacrifice one thing for something else. So this one, um, we, we settled on 125th of a second. So we've got enough blare in, in the rotors. I didn't get the full disc. I, I would have needed to have been down probably 160th of a second, 180th. Um, we just couldn't do it because of the movement uh, from the aircraft I was stationed in. 
So, but all the things start coming together now when you, when you think about the IBIS and the camera helped me a lot because that helped take a lot of the, the, the small movements out of my hands where I was concentrating more on, on the rock which, which was going on. Um, I could see the exposure value because I'm looking through an electronic viewfinder. Um, and all these things help make that image possible because we weren't, we weren't coming in for long. It was pretty much um, um, going straight into land just because of the, the, the way the, um, the the situation was with the winds. All these pictures I'm showing you have got all the uh, metadata at the bottom right-hand corner. So if you're interested in the type of camera, the shutter speed, the ISO value, uh, the aperture setting, everything is there down the bottom. So one of the, the, the lenses I really enjoy using is the 12 to 24 millimeter G lens, uh, the Sony. And I like getting really wide views. I mentioned before about when you shoot from a certain set height, that you need to deviate away from that to give the viewer a different perspective and a different view on what you're presenting. But again, you can do it with, with lens choice. Shooting a 12 millimeter on a, a full frame camera, it really opens up to a different, uh, a different perspective on things. It will make things closer to the lens look a bit bigger and maybe push things away further than what they would naturally look. But you can you can make you know quite symmetrical shots and, and strong shots and play with colours and, and different things. So uh, this this is one of the this is a picture of uh, Nikki actually. Um, Nikki is one of the pilots, and she was just preparing for a night flight. She's got the night vision goggles on there. Um, so we're at ISO three thousand two hundred, and you can see the super clean on on, on the files uh, straight out of these cameras. This is Nikki about to launch off now, and she's uh, got Craig in there with her. All the flight crew are, are multi, um, multi skilled. I suppose is the right word for them. Uh, I'll just mention Craig. Craig, Craig is a um, is a paramedic. He's also um, a fully qualified flight crew member. He deals with navigation, um, observations, preparation of the aircraft. He's also a high speed um, road driver as well. And the dedication shown by the crew really, really struck me because they never stop learning. They're always pushing um, the qualifications, uh, the medical qualifications. Everything about them is dedication and always wanting to be the best of, at what they can possibly be. Um, and every single one of them is the same. The pilots, paramedics, everybody um, at the same level of dedication. So just on this picture, um, I wanted to get the full uh, disc, the full spin from the rotors. And as you can see, they're absolutely huge. The massive rotors on, on this aircraft. Um, so I'm hand holding. I didn't want to be taking anything out there with the tripod or whatever. It had to be straight out and straight back in. Um, and whenever you're working around the aircraft, you can't really have anything lying around on the floors or anything. It, it literally does have to be what you can hold is all you can take. So I was down to um, one fifteenth of a second. That's that's one five, one fifteenth of a second handheld. Uh, ISO six forty. Um, it's a twenty four mil G Master lens, and it was uh, shot at f two. But it needed to be that lens, and it, it's crystal clear. This lens, even wide open, or you know, nearly wide open at f two. So we get the full disc. The the lights you can see in the rotors there are just the reflections coming up from the uh, the landing lights on the floor. Um, but again, it's testament to the, the IBIS in the camera. It's a handhold at 1 15th of a second. And bear in mind, I will have been getting buffered to the bow from the, uh, the downdraft of the prop of the roses as well. Um, so it's, it's a great system. And all these things allow you to, to get the, the pictures, what you're trying to achieve. So this is a shot of Matt. Um, Matt is an ex-army helicopter pilot. Uh, he's, he's flew all around the world. Lots of different types of uh, aircraft he's flown, uh, specifically helicopters. And Matt ended his military career as a test pilot for the Army. And you don't get to be a test pilot for the Army unless you're the absolute cream of the crop. Um, and it, it was it was a pleasure to fly with Matt, a uh, superb pilot, um, absolutely fantastic, fully in control, very considerate, um, but always um, absolutely 100% uh, professional in everything what he does. Uh, I mentioned the paramedics before. The pilots are just the same. Every, even in the downtime, they're continually 
checking the systems, checking the screens, uh, checking the kit. There's, there's no time wasted at all with them. Um, everything is rehearsed, practiced, the briefings, nothing is left to chance in the whole operation of what they do. Um, so what I wanted to do with Matt's picture, I wanted to catch him in his office. So this, you know, the cockpit is his office, really. Um, he's a high caliber pilot. I wanted to show his dedication, his concentration. Um, and he's a really nice guy, Matt. But there's certain times uh, when, he, when he's about to fly or if he's took a, you know, a, a call for an emergency, he changes. It just it goes into full flight mode. Um, and it's just completely different. And it's that what I wanted to catch. It's that energy from what I wanted to catch in this shot. So uh, this is A7R3 this time, shooting with the 12 to 24 millimeter G lens again. And I'm using that articulating screen this time. I've got the camera down on the, on the seat. I've got the screen, the screen back so I can see what's happening. I've got the eye auto focus, taking care of the focus on the eye. It does focus through the visor. So it's locked onto his eye, so now that eye is nice and sharp. I can see the exposure value. And I'm literally just moving the camera slightly left and right just to get the composition what I wanted, um, which is that big glove there um, and the arm leading you back up to his face. I've exposed for the sky outside because um, we don't want to lose any detail in the sky. And then I've just brought a small LED rotor light in the O2 in just to give a little bit of fill light running back uh, towards Matt there. Um, so that, that was the shot what I wanted, but the, the things that make it possible, again, that rear screen, the eye also focus, really important. Um, and the, what you see is what you get for the exposure value. You know, I can make these pictures really, really quick, and it's, it's important, really important. You can play with perspective as well with the 12 mil. You can move it around slightly, backwards and forwards, and, and really just get a picture which is quite dynamic. So the next one, um, I'm going to show you a few pictures where I've, I've, I've actually used lighting as well. So this is in the control room, and this is Matt, who we've just seen previously. Um, and these control rooms, typically, the you know, the lit with uh, overhead fluorescent lights, which aren't very complimentary to anybody, and they tend to have a bit of a green cast coming from them. Um, so when I'm working indoors like this, the first thing I always want to do is to remove all the bad light switch the lights off, close the wind, wind the blinds down, and just bring in my own light. Um, that map behind Matt is, is the full size of a wall, and they, they have markers on them and protractors and other stuff what they use for working out distances. So I've literally just put a, a blue gel up behind Matt um, just to give good separation and to make that a different colour from, from um, himself. And I've just used a single light just to drop on. Um, just before this shot, something caught Matt's attention on the screen, which he read, and then he just turned back to me. So we're still quite in force here. So um, that's the frame I wanted, really. I didn't really want to pose shots. I just wanted Matt being Matt, um, you know, being a, a pilot and thinking about what he's going to do next. So all important things, again, I auto focus. That um, articulating rear screen, which is what I'm taking the photograph from. I've, I've actually got the camera quite low down. So I'm slightly below uh, Matt's eye level. So that's given Matt a little bit of power. It's raising him up and increasing his presence. Um, and all these things, they may sound small, but when you use them all together, it makes a difference to your shot. And this is um, this is at one of the exhibitions, what we did. And you can see the, uh, the TV screen on the wall there, uh, the digital wall. And... It's testament, really, to the quality of files that come out of these cameras. I've taken that of a Sony A9, which is a 24-megapixel camera, uh, and even blowing up to that size of image, you can see the quality. And you'd have to be brave if, you, you know, if you've got anything wrong with that file what, whatsoever. When you show it digitally at this size, it's going to show up. It'll magnify. But these files have to come out as beautiful, and especially in the blue channel as well, which historically... Um, of the you know problematic for me in DSLR yeah photography which I've done in the past um, and there's another one of Richard and again useful files you know even blown up to that size they, they look really really well so um this is a shout I went out with this is Dan and um 
you've got to be quick when these uh, when these calls come in because uh, the, the guys don't wait for anybody. <laughs> Once they've got the, the kit ready and, and they're in the car, they're gone, and they actually missed an earlier shout. Um, so this one came in, and it was somebody who'd had a fall, uh, suspected uh, internal injuries, um, an open uh, break to the arm. So it, it was quite an important call, this. A wheelchair air ambulance operate with two RRVs, which are rapid response vehicles, and they use these uh, when the, when there's times maybe the helicopter is already out on a shout and they need to, to go and support, they'll take a car, or perhaps the helicopter is being refuelled or it's not able to fly at that one time. Or if by road, it's quicker to get there than the helicopter. It could be that it's closer. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's a cut-off in terms of mileage, which the car is quicker because you can get in and, and just drive straight there. So I'm out with Dan, and we're making our way to this call. A couple of things I wanted to do with this. I wanted, again, like I did with the helicopter shot with Matt, I wanted to show the office. I wanted to show the car wrapped around Dan. So I'm shooting with the 12 mil to 24 millimeter again, shooting it at the wide end. Um, ISO 800, F5.6, I've stopped down from F4 just to get a little bit more depth of field, a bit more in focus inside the car. I didn't want to go too far because I don't want to start bringing the outside of the car in, in, into focus. I want to keep that separation uh, with Dan away from the outside. But he also wanted to get some movement from the outside, some blur. The easiest thing in the world would be to go to a fast shutter speed and just freeze everything. But we don't want that. We want to, we want to imply movement. We want to see some movement from the outside. So this is shot at one fiftieth of a second. And again, similar to when I was in the helicopter chase, helicopter uh, photographing back to Helium 22. I've got to find the shutter speed which is slow enough to cause some blur, but not go too far where then Dan would become blurred as well. So again, it's a compromise. But all these things come into um, into being. Um, electronic viewfinder, I can see the exposure value. I can see if it's bright enough or too dark, and I can change it. I can see, I can see that depth of field. I can gauge that. I can see the blur happening outside as I'm looking through the electronic viewfinder. All these things allow me to take the picture. I can see the good focus, um, what I'm achieving as well. So when we came back, um, this was on day three, um, and I was down there. In, I had one day in June, one in July, one in August. And this was one of the shots which I wanted to, to make, um, which is the, the one of the RRVs um, uh, speeding down the road. Now, this was the last day, and this was the last opportunity I had to make this shot because we were losing light. I did try to do it earlier on, but we couldn't do it due to operational reasons. So we just I just returned uh, from the, the call with Dan, and thankfully uh, the person who had the fall wasn't as badly injured as what was reported or suspected, um, and they went away in the land ambulance to A and A um, just to have some um, some checks done or some treatment. So that was that was brilliant news. So we came back and I said to Dan, "Look, I want to make this shot," and he said, "Well, how long will it be?" And I said, "It'll be three minutes." And he said, "How would you know it'll be three minutes?" And I said. I promise you it'll be three minutes. And I'll let you see why I knew it would be three minutes in a moment. So basically what I did was, behind the scenes, this is from a mobile phone, um, I mounted the camera on the end of a, an extension bar, and then that extension bar is attached to the camera on two suction cups. The camera is an A9, and it's uh, got a remote um, shutter um, release uh, mounted to the top of the camera. In an ideal world, I would have perhaps got somebody to just put stand at the back of the car and push the car slowly forward. But in this instance, uh, we had to drive it because we just didn't have time and I'd promised three minutes, so that was it. Um, but on a private road, so there's no problems with any road use. And um, I just asked Stan to just roll the car very very slowly forward because i've got a shutter speed of one second it's blurred the background it's got uh, spin on the wheels and again when i spoke about the aircraft earlier perhaps having a good spin on the rotors or and you know propellers 
Um, it's the same with cars as well. You want to see movement in the wheels. We want to see the background panning away. You want to imply movement and power into the pictures. If you take them at a fast shutter speed, which is the easiest thing to do, and you freeze the wheels, you freeze the background, you might as well go to a car park and take it, to, to be honest. It, it looks just the same. Uh, we want to imply that movement. So I'm at ISO 50. I'm, I'm that low down because I want to, you know, um, a, a long shutter speed. Uh, 12 millimeter again, right at the wide end. Um, aperture at F18, again, just to... Uh, let very little light come in so we, we can get a good exposure at one second. And then you can just see the, the, the bar uh, looking back towards the car. And it's just a simple case then I force you shopping that out. A um, little bit of um, contrast increase, which also brought out a little bit more saturation and then crop to suit and then and that's done. So I promised that I'd explain why I knew it would take three minutes. And that is why because it's a shot which I knew I wanted to take and I practiced over and over and over again. The setup, the breakdown, um, ballpark where my settings need to be. And the photographers who are watching tonight, um, I highly recommend if you were going anywhere on site and there's a particular type of shot what you need to take, practice it before you go. Learn it. Don't, don't learn your trades on other people's time laying it on your own when you go there you can kick into action get your shot what you need and come away um the watch your air ambulance people their time is so precious fact there's no way i could go there and start trying to learn how to do a shot and playing with variables i had to know i could do the shot so um again train learn practice um there's, there's, there's nothing better in the world and this is Dan. I brought him inside uh, just before he finished shift, and I took a picture with him here. Um, and again, it's 85 mil uh, G Master lens, absolutely fantastic uh, portrait lens. I've shot him at f 1.8. It does open up to f 1.4, but I just didn't want to lose too much um, too much focus really with the, with an, a too narrow depth of field because uh, he's quite a quite a big guy, Dan. Um, so I wanted to make sure I had enough of his face. Uh, nicely in focus. Listen with a single rotor light just coming down. And again, you know, when you think about the, the Sony A9, I, sh I shoot top flight sports with that camera. I've just had it hanging upside down off a car. Um, I do my press work with it. Um, and now I'm shooting portraiture with it like this. It, it's a fantastic all round camera, as they all are. So, this is another lightning shot um, picture I'd like to share with you. And again, the 12 to 24 mil. I did say I like shooting at really wide um, focal lengths. And I've shot this one. Uh, let me see. I've shot it at 16 mil, so it's not as wide as what uh, it could be shot at. So this room, this, this is Rocky. This is Paul Rock. And Rocky comes from um, South Africa originally. And he worked in the fire service over there. And he worked as a paramedic. When he came to the UK, he had to retrain because um, the... A qualification system is different. So as dedicated as he is, Rocky, he went back to university, requalified as a paramedic. So Rocky's just being on a shout here, and he's just replenishing his, his medical bag. And this room, what we're in, um, it's highly controlled, uh, the access to it. It's got controlled drugs in there, which the guys need uh, for when they're going out uh, for pain relief or or other things what to do and so you're not normally allowed in there on your own so i couldn't set up the light and um i had to wait till one of the guys came in so again using the same procedure i mentioned earlier take away all the bad light i've, I've switched off the fluorescence up above and um, there was a, a door with a, a glass panel letting some sunlight in i've blocked that off i think i threw a coat over that um and I've used four lights. I've used two lights to flood the background with blue, blue gel white. I've used um, a light top right hand corner of the frame, which has got barn doors on, which is just funneling the light down on, onto Rocky. And then I've just added another light just to the camera left on the tabletop, just to give a little bit of fill down Rocky's arm there. Uh, but this, this whole process takes minutes. And again, it's 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 down to the cameras. It's you know, um 
I can see the exposure value. I can see the color temperatures. Um, and using eye autofocus again, it's just an incredible system, and it's changed the way um, I, I, I shoot uh, certainly over the last four years. And there we go with the crop and finish. You know what? One of the things as well I found with, with this system is I used to spend a lot more time on the computer editing from what I do since I've been shooting Sony because there's so little less to do because you get you can get it more right in camera more easily. Um, so this picture is um, where are we? This is Big Rob, and um, one of the things. He's called Big Rob for good reason. He's six foot seven. He's you know he's, he's quite a tall there, uh, chap. And one of the things I wanted to do with Rob um, was get something which was a little bit more creative with him. Uh, but unfortunately, he, he was he was he had something going on, and he was he was on the computer quite a bit and on the phone. Um, so I was having to wait my time with him. So I sort of had this shot in mind. So the the hangar is behind Rob where the helicopter sits. We had Helimo two two out on the on the H on the um, the launch pad. So when Rob came out, I said, quickly pop your helmet on. I brought him out to here. Um, you can see how bright it is in the visor. You can see the sharp shadows under the aircraft. Very very tight. You know, it's either shadow or it's sunlight. That's how bright it was. You can see the sun was was pretty much um, right up in the sky. It's on top of the aircraft. Um, so what I've done, I've got Rob standing in the shadow of the um of the hangar so it's come out the doors but there's just that little bit of area which is still in shade and i've just popped a little bit of light from low down just to bring out his skin tones um i've shot this with the 24 millimeter g master lens a7r3 and i've just literally i'm, I'm sort of sambo um, samba dancing um trying to get a position where i can look up um, but not be in that reflection so um yeah, this, this is what we ended up with, and actually, you can see the, the reflections um, from the hangar and the um, and the visor there. So that was one of the ones what we got from that. This was the second one what we did, and again, I'm thinking editorial now. I'm thinking about you know um, range of shots, what we what they're going to be used for. Uh, this is going to make a great double double spread for somebody who needs to lay text on the the left hand side. So again, we're looking for that reflection from Helima two two. Coming into the side of the visor, and I shot this one with the 135 uh, f1.8 G master lens, and you can just see the way it's totally knocked that background out. It's, it's absolutely fantastic lens. It's razor sharp at f1.8, but it'll, it'll just destroy your background. It'll just give you total separation. Um, this is Craig again, and I've used a, a similar technique this time as what I did with um, with Rob earlier. I've just got Craig standing in the shaded area outside the hangar, and I've just lit him with a with a light to just bring out his skin tones and his eye detail. Um, and again, this one is uh, the 135 again with the F1.8. And you can see the body of the Helimed 2.2 in the hangar. You know, there's a lot going on in there. It's got the doors open, um, just different items uh, on the walls, but you've still got a good level of separation to, to bring Craig forward away from the background. And again, when, when we're thinking about what we're using, um, what you see is what you get. I'm setting up um, exactly the um, the exposure value I want to see. I see the color balance, uh, which you can change the color balance on, on the lights where I use the rotor lights digitally. Uh, because Craig's standing in a shaded area, his skin tones would shift slightly blue. If it didn't light them, so I've lit them and I've, I've just um, just got a slightly warm light on them to, to bring them skin tones out and using the eye also focus again to get good um, good focus on the eye. So different lens this time. Um, I've used the zoom 70 to 200 millimeter G master lens on the Sony A9. And when you're out and about, when you're walking around, the zoom lenses are the best, really, because you, there's certain scenarios you don't want to be too close to. So um, having the zoom, it just gives you that flexibility to get closer without physically getting closer. Um, so shot at F4 just to increase that depth of field to get more of Craig and, and Richard in, in focus in this place. 
it's important with photography as well. It's um, as photographers, you know, you, you have you have a, a duty, really, a responsibility to um, in what you show. So, for me, I always try and show every subject matter that I photograph. I always show it in the absolute best light. Um, I'd much rather show the best of something than the worst of something. So it's always these things you need to, to bear in mind. You always want to show everything, every situation to, to the absolute best it can be. So using the 12 millimeter again, low down, and we've just got the guys coming off the um, Helimed 2.2. And this is flying back to um, the airbase. And again, it's that 12 millimeter. I mean, the body of the aircraft, um, Helimed 2.2, it looks huge when from the outside but once you get in it sort of shrinks by the time you've got all the, the medical equipment in there and um, all the comms um you've got the the part where your patient lies down in the back everything sort of the space sort of disappears so i'm actually in one of the rear um passenger seats at the moment and there's just a hole in the headrest so i've literally just poked the lens through the hole um, just to get try and get a big uh, cockpit view, and this is twelve mil, and this is um, this is Matt flying actually, and uh, it's just banked it over. Um, but we're just heading back to base, so it's, it's, again, it's a, it's a nice um, an office view if you like of where of where the guys are, are working there. And this is Nikki. Uh, she's one of the pilots, and I did a similar shot of this with Matt. But where Matt was quite menacing in, in some respects, where he's, he's, he's quite intense, he's looking straight down at the camera, uh, he's got his visor down, which is covering part of his face, he's got a black glove. Um, Nikki's different. Nikki's shot is more airy. Uh, she's got white gloves on. Um, she's got a visor up. Uh, she's looking away from the camera. It's just a totally different type of shot. Uh, I've set her up the same. It's um, exposed for the sky. I've, brought, I've introduced a little bit of light to to light up the Nikki skin tones, but it's just a different shot. And it's surprising how different um, the same environment can be with with different characters, with different people. Uh, but it's it's all down to body shape, body size as well. I suppose where Matt was leaning further over to the switch gear. Um, further towards the camera, so different type of shot. A nine again, twelve to twenty four millimeter. This is like a reverse shot of what I did with um, with Craig outside the, the hangar earlier. Um, and this is Sophie. She's a, a critical care paramedic. And one of the things in this scenario, all you can do, um, we're actually inside the hangar at this point. All we can do is expose for the outside. We're, we've got no control over the sun whatsoever, so we have to expose the camera to bring down the exposure value um, of the outside of, of the hangar, which is what I've done. It's still quite bright, but it's it's there. It's exposed well. Then, because Sophie is inside the hangar, she's pretty much in shade. It's, it's you know, there's it's, it's a big big range difference between what's outside and what's inside. So I'm using two rose lights. Um, and just cross lighting across Sophie just to bring the exposure value up on her up. Uh, I've also warmed the light up as well because the, the, the light shifts in the shadow. It goes blue and it just makes the skin tones a little bit more murky. Uh, but these lights just bring the, the, the tones back out. So that's a A9 135mm G Master lens. Um, ISO 100, which is you know, showing how, uh, how bright it was outside. 1 1600 of a second f1.8. And that's the setup shot, and then when we bring it in together, it just looks a natural type of picture. And again, EVF, I can see the colour temperature form onto um, onto Sophie's face. I can balance it up with the lights. If I need to warm the lights more, I can do it before you even take the picture. There's none of this taking a shot and seeing how it looks, and then going through it again. I can do it, set it up once, take the picture, and then we move on. I auto focus as well, f1.8, uh, critically sharp on the iris. Similar type of shot. Um, again, rotor light, balancing from the outside, um, and just a single. I think there's a setup shot actually on the uh, Society's uh, poster put up earlier of this. And there she is in the studio environment inside. 
And again, um, 85 mil G Master, fantastic portrait lens on the Sony A9. And I've shot this one wide open f1.4. Uh, same setup as what I did earlier with Dan when he finished his shift. But I shot Dan at f1.8 uh, because Sophie, is, she's a smaller person because she's she's um, she, she's a woman. Um, she's more petite in the face as well. So f1.4, I could shoot at narrower depth of field and still get enough of a face with, in the in good focus general wide view with the 12 mil just taking all of the the hanger in and this view is from up on the first floor looking back this this is actually through glass um but it's still a nice wide view of the, the hangar and the and the aircraft and another setup shot this is the control room and this is where uh, the, the HEMS crew are, are based when they're operational. And they've got a lot of things going on in there. They've got different screens on the wall. They've got one for weather. They've got one for NOTAMs, which is um, a notice to airmen of anything taking place. You know, if there's any hot air balloons up or military exercises, anything what they need to be aware of in that particular airspace that they have to um, um, take stock of, really, if they're going to be flying in that direction. Rocky is sitting looking at maps. And I mentioned before that they're always doing something, even when they're not on a call. And this is Rocky. He's he's reading maps. He's learning maps. He knows the area extremely well. He's still reading the maps. Um, that is um, Rob over there. He's um, looking at a read out somewhere. But anyway, I, I want to take a picture of Rob, the pilot. So first thing I need to do is get rid of the bad light, which are the ceiling lights and that window light. So I knock the, knock the light switch off, close the blinds down on the window. So now I've got more control over the environment. Again, I'm using um, rotor lights with the blue gels on just to fill um, the ambient light with, with blue. And the light which is at the front of the frame, there's a it's shining down onto a desk where Rob was previously before he took that call. And he was playing with that data uh, pad whatever it is there so I knew he was going to come back so I just wasted my time I popped the lights up there and I knew when he came off that call he was going to slide back over to this desk and when he did come over um, he tapped in to the um, uh, the data pad uh, and again like I mentioned about Matt earlier these pilots go into their own little world they start thinking and they're absorbed in thinking about what they're going to be doing next or potential eventualities. And it's that moment that I like to capture of them. So um, this was Sony A9. And again, I'm shooting off that articulating rear screen. I haven't got the camera to my face. Uh, so the camera is slightly lower. And silent shutter mode. He doesn't even know I'm taking the picture. I auto focus. Um, shot at a 3.5, a 3.5. And it's just an easy way to work with these cameras. Okay, 12 millimeter again. And this is Louise. This was um this was on a, an out flight. Uh, we were we were going out somewhere. And I just wanted to capture the inside and outside scenario really um, as we as we were in flight. So a nice big wide angle. And if anybody knows the Wiltshire area, they probably recognize where that is from some of the landmarks or buildings which are there. And that brings us pretty much to um, the end of the presentation. I mean, the whole assignment is shot, I think, about 3,000 images. Um, and there's so many pictures of so many different scenarios and different things going on. Uh, but very conscious of the time, what we've got tonight. Um, and I did promise I wouldn't make it into um, a Ken Dodd one where it goes on for three or four hours. And, um, you know, we we'll never see until the next day type of uh, thing. So... I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, that's all I've got to show you tonight. And um, over to you, Col. It's, it's been a fantastic presentation tonight, Terry. It really has. Uh, such an interesting insight to, you know, the, uh, into the, the, the project itself. But, you know, I, I think we all see, you know, what, what, what these crews do on a, you know, a day-to-day -day basis, but we never see what goes on behind the background uh, at these places. And it's a, a really interesting insight. You know, you, you're capturing the... 
you know, all the kind of inner gubbins, you know, inside the um, the offices and all the charts they're using and or the computer systems and, you know, inside the helicopter itself. It, it's a really interesting perspective into uh, the work they, they do and the, the fantastic work they do. Uh, but before we jump onto the Q and A, uh, I think we're going to head over to Mark because um, uh, Wilkinson have uh, got some fantastic offers uh, today, which Mark has organised with them. Uh, but also, there's some fantastic offers from Sony anyway. So, um, do you want to let us know uh, all about that, Mark? Yeah, thanks, Colin. Um, thanks, Terry. That was an amazing insight. To uh, you know, obviously, you know, we're not we don't see that type of activity, and you've captured it. You know, it's an inspiration. It really is. Thank you for that. And thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Back to the obviously the teams that are involved. You know, it's wow. It's uh, you, you're quite taken back with with the workload and 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 the commitment. It's mm. incredible. Yeah. So, um, thank you so much. Um, offers, yes. So Wilkinsons, uh, we're working with Wilkinsons with this webinar with Terry and the societies. And um, I'll just bring up a website here that uh, Wilkinsons have created. Um, so it's uh, wilkinsons.co.uk forward slash promotion Sony Live. Um, this was from a, a previous uh, a webinar, but instead of Amy 10, it's Terry 10. And there is a three day expiry date on those offers. So it entitles you to 10% off uh, on top of any current uh, offers we have across the UK and Ireland, um, which uh, is offers like cashback. So 10% um, off cashback continues till Friday. Uh, so uh, the 31st of July, our summer cashback campaign uh, finishes on Friday. So please try and take advantage of these offers. If you are looking to uh, buy a new Sony product, uh, add it to your kit bag or look to switch. Well, and if there are customers um, that are uh, looking to purchase through Wilkinson's, then please give the stores a ring. They'll be more than happy to talk to you if you've got a uh, kit to trade in, um, if you're looking to uh, raise a bit of cash with what you've got and they've also got their own offers as well and just finally if you have purchased a product um, in the last year and you haven't registered it please do go to this website and you will be entitled to uh, an additional year's warranty for for absolutely nothing um and if you do go ahead and buy something in the next few weeks few months up until january next year then please register because you uh, it's about 30 pounds i think an extra year's warranty so on top of what your retailer is already offering so lots of offers there to take advantage of and uh, once again terry and, and colin thank you very much for this opportunity oh thank you mark perfect uh right we'll go to a few questions and answers mm -hmm. uh so we'll go to john john is asking terry they uh, did they give you any some sort of instructions regarding the safety and if so did it impact your ability to get the type of shots you wanted absolutely great question um each day, uh, there was a, a safety briefing, um, risk assessments, um, and yeah, you know, you, you there were certain places I could go to um, alone. There were certain places I had to have somebody with me, um, and in these, some of the areas are actually, um, you know, the we, we were given passes to talk us through electronic doors. Um, they had to have a higher level um, of pass to get to certain areas. But yes, certainly, um, if I was outside, I was always had somebody uh, with me. Certainly when the helicopter was flying, it was if I was anywhere near the helipad, um, one of the flight crew would be with me. Um, and they did actually hold your arm as well. Uh, they did hold onto your arm um, just to make sure you were safe, you didn't fall or that anything didn't happen. Uh, didn't really affect my ability to get shot because I was quite open with what I wanted to do. Some shots I had a shot list, and we discuss if they were possible quite early on. If they were possible, we'd do it. Um, if they carry the risk, which was deemed to be too much of a risk, then we'd agree not to do it and replace it. But a lot of the pictures, what we did do, which you've only seen a very small portion tonight, a lot of the pictures um, were pretty much run and gone. It was when somebody was available, um, and i just try and pin them down for that second um, and, and, and and try and get some of the pictures knocked off. Brilliant. Um, just before we go to the next question, yeah. uh, Wilkinson Cameras have just posted up to say to get a quick and easy um, part exchange quote online, then you go on wilkinsons.co.uk forward slash W 
forward slash part hyphen exchange. So just pull up that comment there, just if anybody is interested in getting the part exchange. Uh, to the next question, Martin Pickles. Let's go to Martin. So Terry, were the road slides on continuous for the portrait taken in the shadow of the hangar and looking out at the helicopter? Yes. I always, I always use... Um, Martin knows me. Uh, Martin, I like things to be simple and easy. Um, continuous light is easier than flash. There are times when I would use flash, uh, but this wasn't one of them. Um, just continuous. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> just going to the next one. Sorry about this. We've had so many comments saying what a fantastic presentation it's been tonight. That <laughs> I'm struggling to find the, yeah, the questions that were asked before. So Kirsty's asking, uh, do you use Lightroom Classic and Photoshop CC, or do you use a different software to edit your images? Yeah, um, just Lightroom Classic. That that's just what you just use Lightroom Classic and that's it. Yeah, I mean I've got Photoshop as well. Um, so if I need to do any sort of cloning or layering, I'll go into Photoshop. But normally, just Lightroom. Brilliant. I think we'll go to the last question for tonight, and it's off the lovely Jean. I think this was asked quite early on. So sorry, Jean, that you, you've waited so long. And I think this was uh, while you're doing your intro, and it came in just as we had just moved on. Uh, mm. So Jean is asking, what differences do you find uh, between photography and videography? Um, in terms of, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I, I, th I think I think the question came in when, when you were you saying that you you were you did a bit more video and then you switched back to photography. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, well, I mean, from from a point of view of, of, of being creative and. Um, you know, finding good composition. They're, they're pretty similar um, in many respects. And a, a lot of the pictures, what I what I do, and a lot of the compositions I aim for, I, I actually take from the movie industry. When it's, you know, perhaps I'll see in a film an unusual angle or whatever, and I try and replicate. So th there's a there's a quick there's a lot of there's a you know there's there's a pass over between the two in a lot of respects. Same for lighting as well. You know, a lot of cinematic type lighting works really really good in stills photography. I mean, the big difference, obviously, is, is, is going to be, you know, you're not um, you, you, you're not stuck with a, a gimbal or uh, a tripod all the time as you are in video. But certainly, composition, lighting, um, those sorts of things carry across just equally as well in stills as they do um, in, in movie work. Brilliant. Uh, I am going to I'm going to do one more question because it's literally just come in and it's a great question. Uh, Siri so saying, are there any similar projects? Uh, you would want to do it in the future? Yes, there was actually one I should have been working on now, which we had to um, cancel due to COVID-19. Um, it's another emergency service. Uh, but unfortunately, that's been it's been shelved, um, if not completely cancelled now. Um, but yeah, I'm always looking for, for good projects. So I, I like a challenge. Um, I'm a big believer, as I know Colin is and Mark, that, in, in giving back to the industry um, in any way what we can. And if we can raise awareness, um, raise funds for the, these great organisations. I, I know Colin, um, not many people may know, or they may know, but Colin is um, in the in the RNLI. And, and, and he's the same, you know, it's an emergency service. And, and that is another one, which is, um, is it self-funding, Colin? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, charitable donations only, yeah. yeah Self-funding. So there's a lot of things going, you know, around the country which, which need support. And photography, and Sony in particular, and, and, and Mark also, um, will bear me up on this fact, they like to give back and they like to support things um, um, and particular projects, what, what we like to get involved in. Brilliant. Perfect. Yeah, it's uh, as I said to, to you before, I, I thought the presentation was... Uh, and you know the project you did it was fantastic at, at showing these stories that that we don't we don't tend to see you know in, in the press we see all the work that they do but we don't see everything what goes on behind the scenes so uh, it was fa fascinating to listen uh tonight to to the uh to the how you approach the project and of course all, all you know all the equipment you used and, and the techniques that you've used to to capture those stories uh in in a fantastic set of um set of images a really really interesting night 
If you have tuned in halfway through, uh, I forgot to mention it before that this uh, webinar has been recorded, so it'll be live on. Uh, it'll be kept on our Facebook page. Uh, it'll also be on the societies.net forward slash webinars. So if you came in halfway through, don't worry, you've not missed it. You can re-watch it uh, on on either of those two. Uh, but I think that's it for tonight. A fantastic webinar indeed. I really enjoyed it, and thanks again to you both for being here tonight and uh, being part of the webinar. It's great, and we're looking forward to being back for the next one very soon. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Thank Mara. Thanks, Thank Terry. You very, thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.